Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 215 session of TLTC's annual conference. Um, today's one hour session is focused in on flow restoration efforts in Texas with a subtitle Jumping into the Deep End Lessons from Entering the Water Trade. And this is somewhat of a follow up on a panel that we did at last year's session in Austin, which seems eons ago, uh, where Kyle Garmany of the Nature Conservancy, Charlene Lurig of Texas Water Trade, and myself, I think it was the three of us that presented on developing the capacity of conservation groups to work on water issues and rest flow restoration issues in Texas. And so we're, now a year later, it seems like two or three years later, uh, but we're here to talk about what we've experienced over the last year and what we've learned. And this is gonna be a interactive session. Um, I'm gonna do a few slides just to sort of set the stage. Um, and then I have a question that I'm gonna pose for each of the panelists who I will introduce um, and We'll invite questions from folks to put them in the chat box. First, specifically on the question that I'll be asking individual panelists, and then time dependent at the end, um, opening it up for, for questions and, and dialogue. So first, uh, I'm Andrew Perkey. As I said, I'm a consultant with a group called AMP Insights. And I've been working over the last year with Texas Water Trade and the Nature Conservancy to support the efforts of um, Audubon Texas, Galveston Bay Foundation and Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. And uh, we are uh, focused in as a group on these flow issues, building on a legacy of effort that's occurred in the state of Texas, uh, really over the last nearly 25 years. Um, my interactions with Texas water issues started in 1997 with enactment of Senate Bill 1, which created the Texas Water Trust to be able to hold water rights that could be restored for conservation purposes. Uh, in fact, I first came to talk with agency folks from Texas Parks and Wildlife uh, when I was the director of the Oregon Water Trust to talk about what we were doing in the Pacific Northwest and how it might be applicable in Texas. Um, subsequent to that, a group formed called the Trans-Pecos Water Trust, which was organized to try to restore flows in the Rio Grande and in the Pecos rivers of West Texas. And I was at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation at that time, directing uh, the Western Water Program and provided funding support to this group to try to get some traction on market-based transactions. Um, shortly thereafter, Senate Bill 3 was enacted in 2007, which really drove prioritization around environmental flow recommendations. Really a science-based and social science-based approach to what is needed in different bays and estuaries and basins around the state for flows. And that sets the, the, the foundation, if you will, for these market-based voluntary efforts um, that are going on now. Um, and nothing really coalesced again in a, in a big way until 2014 when the Texas Environmental Flows Initiative was created, which was a partnership of multiple NGOs, uh, including NWF and TNC, uh, Meadows Center, um, and several others to look at increasing environmental flows into critical bays around the, uh, along the coast, primarily in response to the funding that was being made available uh, through the Gulf Horizon uh, mitigation effort. And a lot was accomplished through that effort. One such accomplishment was in 2016, Kyle Garmany was hired, hired by TNC to really focus on developing water transactions as part of this environmental flows initiative, but also in other parts 
of the state. And Kyle is one of our panelists today to talk about that work. Um, subsequent to the wrap up of TEFI, the Environmental Flows Initiative, Charlene Lurig became, helped found and became the first CEO of Texas Water Trade. So about two and a half years ago now. And really in this period, a lot has accelerated in terms of uh, supporting the conservation community to do this work. And one of the primary vehicles through which that's occurred is the Market Makers Program that TWT created in 2020. Um, and the purpose of the Market Makers Program was to build partner capacity to be able to acquire water temporarily, permanently, surface water, groundwater, to achieve conservation objectives and to account for uh, outcomes uh, that was, were uh, delivered uh, through the water that was acquired and restored. The Market Makers program was really inspired by the Columbia Basin Water Transactions Program here in the Pacific Northwest. I directed this program at NIFWIF before I uh, went to work more broadly on Western water issues. And it's really a, an example of a, a multi-year commitment of funding and capacity and support to groups that are restoring water rights to critical stream reaches in the basin for anadromous and resident fish. Um, and while there's many differences between the Columbia and Texas, there are similarities in terms of water management and water allocation and the approaches and tools that could be used to achieve conservation outcomes. Um, the Market Makers Program is a two-year program. We're in our first class of market makers that Texas Water Trade identified. And the, the delivery is of community, of technical support, of funding, of representation on freshwater issues uh, in Texas and uh, all sorts of aspects of this work, uh, we are providing technical support to the groups. And the solicitation uh, was in 2020, and we based that solicitation on some priority basins. Uh, let me also just add before I move forward that the Texas Flows Fund is a fund that Texas Water Trades created, and they put out their first solicitation to fund transactions, not just from the market makers, but by any other interested party just this past winter. Um, so keep an eye out on that. Um, but the market makers program RFP in 2020 was based on the priority basins that Texas Water Trade had identified with its advisory council. Um, and you can see the list here, pretty wide ranging across the state. And in that first solicitation, uh, a group of three market makers were uh, qualified. And this is the uh, set of panelists today, Audubon, Texas, and representing them is Romy Swanson. Uh, Galveston Bay Foundation, we have both Danielle Goshen and Matt Singer. And then Wimberley Valley uh, Watershed Association, David Baker uh, is representing Wimberley Valley. And then we also have um, Charlene Lurig, who's here on behalf of Texas Water Trade to talk about, to engage around their work to restore um, Comanche Springs in Fort Stockton. And then Kyle Garmany uh, from the Nature Conservancy who's working throughout the state on these flow restoration issues. So end of slides there. Um, and we're gonna open it up now and I have um, questions and I'm gonna start with uh, Audubon and Romy. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask him to respond to this question. I'm gonna invite the other panelists to weigh in uh, if they have input and invite you all to put questions in the chat box uh, that we can pose. And then we'll pause, pivot to the next question and, and proceed that way. So Romy, um, what are the challenges? And let me preface this with Audubon is working through this market maker program in the Pecos River watershed of West Texas. Obviously Galveston Bay Foundation's working in Galveston Bay focused on East and West Bays and Wimberley Valley Watershed Association's focused 
on Jacob's well there um, in their backyard. Um, but for Romy, what are the challenges of restoring flows in a desert location in West Texas, particularly one that is also quite distant from where you're located in Austin? Sure, thank you, Andrew. Um, let me first address the latter part of your question. Many folks are probably most aware of Audubon, Texas' deep legacy work along the Texas coast where we have worked to conserve and restore and steward coastal birds and habitat for just shy of 100 years. But more recently, we are thinking and acting on additional bird conservation opportunities. And often these opportunities resonate on a continental scale through innovations where Texas can serve as a national leader. And we're doing this while looking through multiple conservation lenses, including uh, private grasslands conservation and climate change mediation. The reason we have prioritized the Pecos Basin for the focus of our work is because the region reflects the intersectionality of our highest priority conservation concerns. We believe that we can take the experience of the National Audubon Society's work within other regions of the country and hitch it to the passionate consortium of conservation partners we have here in Texas, all with the aim to leverage meaningful outcomes. As far as the challenges to restoring flows, it, it starts with acknowledging that this is an arid lands river system. The region is dry, rainfall is unpredictable, and every future facing rainfall model you look at suggests that it's only going to become drier. Secondarily, we're working within a system that experiences significant salt loads in the water and is trending saltier through time. And for context, salt has always been an issue within this river system. It was once known as the Rio Salado. And the saltiness doesn't necessarily jive with many of the end users of this specific water that we're working uh, with, um, i.e. the irrigators. Additionally, the management of the water here in this reach of the Pecos River is historically directed towards irrigation uses, a fact that requires innovation in our approaches. And, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that we cannot uh, use all of the traditional tools that we're familiar with. Uh, many of the opportunities may not fit well in delivering dedicated environmental flows along this reach for that reason. Therefore, Audubon Texas and its partners must explore opportunities to work with the farmers and the ranchers within the existing management system to put any water transaction to a beneficial use, which is defined by the water managers uh, as irrigate, irrigation of annually tillable land. And the other challenge we face is to assure effective communication within our current and potential future partners. We must control the narrative and that's essential. Uh, we're working in a deeply conservative and skeptical region uh, where trust must be earned before we can expect the buy-in we hope for. Thanks, Romy. On that last point, how are you approaching building trust with the conservative community, given your organization's mission and given your location in Austin physically? How, right. how are you? Yeah. It, it doesn't necessarily help that our office headquarters is based out of Austin, but um, a lot of the work that we've done to this point in time has, has been the quiet work of trying to understand the region and talk and having the quiet conversation, developing quiet partnerships uh, so that we don't take we, we take as few missteps as possible as we enter into the, a new region. The, the positive is that um, although we you know, we do have a headquarters in Austin, um, we, we are in a government affiliated organization. We're a nonprofit. So that provides us a, a bit more grace. The strategy here is just, to, is just to establish durable relationships with some of the key community members and, and hope that, um, that they can serve as advocates on behalf of, of the brand and the work and that um, they can see us as a partner that has a genuine interest in working with the community as opposed to asserting itself on what it believes uh, conservation looks like for them. Thanks. Kyle and Charlene, you're in a similar... Um situation as Romy, given your location in Austin. The others are obviously working in their backyards. How are you approaching that, particularly in the more distant reaches of the state in West Texas in terms of your work? And you can get into this as well when I ask you your questions, but anything to add at this point would be invited. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I'm Charlene Lurig, uh, CEO of Texas Water Trade. and. A lot of what Romy just said resonated with me because we're working kind of just down the street, so to speak, in Pecos County in the city of Fort Stockton uh, to try to restore Comanche Springs. 
And there it's been um, imperative that we find local champions who can be the face and the voice for the effort, uh, because similar to Audubon, we're based in Austin, we work statewide, but um, it matters a lot to people who it is that's talking about the project um, and the language and the uh, kind of motivation behind it. And um, I'll talk more about it when I talk about the work itself, but uh, being able to discover local champions from elected officials to folks who are just kind of um, uh, boosters for different kinds of work around their community um, has made a tremendous amount of difference. Um, and I'm sure that's true for, for others who are working remotely as well. I hope. Yeah, Andrew, I think um, the way that TNC engages, especially when we're working towards uh, the, the challenge of addressing water scarcity in West Texas, you know, that the stakeholders um, in those communities are facing real challenges when it comes to managing the resource. And, and what we try to bring forward is the science to help um, really develop and inform understanding of the resource so that we can all be better stewards and, and better manage. And in that, you know, development of the science, um, you know, that engagement uh, helps to build trust. And it's that trust that is the foundation of developing the work. Um, really, you know, without that, it's hard to get to the development of strategies that include uh, transactions without having a shared interest as well as, as trust. Thank you. Any uh, attendees have any questions on this, particularly those of you who are in West Texas? Any insights or co questions, comments you have about the work that uh, is being undertaken by Audubon and TNC and Texas Water Trade there? Okay, let's move on. Uh, the next question is for Galveston Bay Foundation. So we're going to swap over to the east side of the state. And this is for uh, Danielle and, and Matt. How do you generate awareness and build support for flow restoration efforts that are needed during dry periods along the coast, given the current and often regional attention on flooding, on too much water? How do you, uh, how do you generate that awareness and support? Yeah, so because of our specific geographic focus in Galveston Bay in Southeast Texas, which as you've uh, mentioned is really defined by more of an abundance of water uh, compared to the rest of the state. We decided to go um, a bit of a different route than some of the other groups in the market makers teams. Um, so instead of the main goal of flow restoration for local waterways, we're planning on using, using market makers transactions for the benefit of wetland habitat creation and enhancement. Uh, so by encouraging landowners to flood fields year round, we can restore coastal wetland habitats that meet regional conservation goals. And while, res while um, storing those amounts of water strategically in local impoundments. Uh, so if and when conditions dictate, we can then unplug those fields and release the water into local waterways and um, isolated estuary and systems, creating localized inflow benefits to that area. Uh, so while we won't be able to impact salinity uh, of the entire base system that would, you know, require a lot of transactions, um, these local water releases may provide essential habitat conditions for key species and then can also be scaled up over time. Great, thank you. And Matt is the Director of Land Protection for Galveston Bay. You're obviously engaging with landowners regularly. I suspect no other audience in the region is aware of the fact that there are periods of drought and not enough water. Does that make it easier for you to communicate with them about these project types that Danielle just outlined? Well, yes and no. Um, we, we do run into the same scenarios as Romy mentioned earlier with a little bit of political untrust and unrest in that area. Um, the, there's a, a long history of uh, defiance in Southern Chambers County from uh, political programs um, and government programs and, and sponsored um, conservation programs in general. Um, but they are uh, changing uh, quickly. And um, we definitely um, like the idea of, of using the dual purpose of this water to uh, incentivize landowners to participate in water conservation transactions by 
um, in enhancing their their properties with um, wetland wildlife habitat, but also having the the um, the opportunity to utilize that water locally for uh, salinity purposes and, and very isolated systems. So, um, you know, one, it is nice to be the the on the ground partner in this in this uh, partnership, but it's also nice to um, uh, to work with uh, organizations that have such great knowledge and experience from a statewide standpoint. Great. And also for attendees, if you do have questions, uh, please put them in the chat box so that they can be conveyed. And there is a bit of a lag, so it might take me a few uh, a minute to get to your question. But I invite others on the panel that um, are engaged on the coast to talk about the challenges and opportunities. You know, Kyle and Charlene, obviously the two of you were active in the Texas Environmental Flow Initiative and the, the sort of discernment between the larger objective of salinity levels in the Bay and estuary ecosystems versus, not versus, compared to localized wetland conditions and just what challenges and opportunities are present in those approaches? Yeah, well, Andrew, I think you kind of laid it out there. Right? I mean, it, the, the scale of the issue is certainly the, the greatest challenge. I mean, when we're discussing uh, environmental water transactions that can have an impact on salinity in, in estuarine systems, it's tens of thousands of acre feet. Um, you know, certainly some of the uh, sort of channel morphology and things uh, can, um, can, can change those impacts. But, um, you know, as Matt mentioned, there's a real opportunity in engaging with local landowners uh, in, in these wetland systems to have a, a multiple impacts through these transactions where holding water, creating habitat, and then releasing water at targeted times to try and have a, a sort of a, a freshening of these, um, uh, of the tributary systems. And so we're, we're very optimistic that through that program and those efforts, those transactions may have a measurable impact to those systems. You know, the, the size of the transactions that we're pursuing on the coast to um, to, to really directly have salinity impacts. Um, the, the approach that we uh, identified through the Environmental Flows Initiative, um, sort of championed by Paul and Tanya, was one where we're looking at direct flow releases from storage with lo large volumes of water and trying to call on that water at a very specific time where you're creating refugia through those, um, for the, through those freshwater releases. So it's less of a uh, direct run of river transactions that are putting large volumes back in and more really targeted, you know, uh, flow releases from storage to try to address, you know, high salinity gradients through those releases. Great. Uh, for the attendees, particularly those of you along the coast, uh, please put any questions or comments in the chat box if you have any. I have one more question for GBF and then we'll pivot to Fort Stockton, which is, how has it been for you all in the last year? Yeah, it's been a year engaging with the market, the market makers program and bringing in this flow water restoration component more explicitly into your work. Well, it's been great to, to meet Charlene and Kyle and work with uh, their organizations and, um, and really, oh, expand our uh, ability to reach out to landowners who are uh, within our, our primary focal area for conservation. Um, it is, um, it, it's not groundbreaking work, you know, creating uh, moist soil uh, wetland units or, or freshwater impoundments on the coast to attract waterfowl, but it is um, interesting uh, take to utilize those water impoundments uh, for the um, for the purpose of creating uh, an artificial freshwater inflow, if uh, we do experience drought conditions, you know we've been in a, a in a period of you know very wet conditions the past three years where we've not had in any um, sign of drought, but um, you know that that time is coming and we'd like to be prepared with this with this project uh, at least demonstrate that it can be done. 
Great. Thank you, Matt and Danielle. So we're going to pivot now to uh, Comanche Springs, Fort Stockton. There's actually a question about how many water right holders in Fort Stockton have participated with Texas water trades efforts so far. So Charlene, I'm going to pose your question to you. Consider that while you're uh, responding. Um, Charlene, how do you respond to the intense demand for water in Pecos County from other sectors, oil and gas, et cetera, agriculture, to accomplish what you're trying to achieve at Comanche Springs? And maybe you can give it just a quick summary of what it is you're trying to achieve at Comanche Springs as well. Sure thing. So, um... Comanche Springs was once the sixth largest spring in the state of Texas. It had a flow rate similar to Barton Springs. Um, and many of you know the story. The spring started to sputter in the 1940s as groundwater production picked up in the area. And they went completely dry for many decades in the early 1960s. Um, we got involved in this work with Robert Mace at the Meadows Center a few years ago. Um, it was at that point, maybe the fifth or sixth year of the spring's flowing intermittently for about a four month uh, flow period when the irrigation pumps in an area called Belding, uh, which is a big irrigation area, um, what go temporarily uh, uh, kind of quiet um, on farm. And the, so the springs have picked up their flow and these springs are karst in a karst formation, the Edwards Trinity Aquifer. They behave uh, in a really similar way to the Edwards Aquifer in San Antonio and in Austin. Um, and so they're, they're very quick to respond to changes in production. Um, so we've been looking for the past two years undertaking a feasibility study um, of uh, whether or not the springs could be brought back to perennial flow, not at their historic volumes. That's unrealistic because as Andrew pointed out, and as we all know, there are many different ways that people use water today um, that aren't going to change. Uh, but we were specifically looking at whether we could restore flow to, to a continuous minimum of 10 cubic feet per second, um, with that target being set because the beautiful historic stone bathhouse in downtown Fort, Fort Stockton, uh, which now has a pool built on stilts that are sunk into the spring bed uh, at 10 CFS, could be restored back to a Balmeray style swimming environment where you have non chlorinated water and uh, a natural kind of Cienega desert habitat where people would be able to go swimming. And um, this is a great kind of cultural jewel um, that, that we were looking at the possibility of restoring. Um, it's important, I think, here, and this is true in lots of the places that y'all are hearing about, to understand how water is currently being used, because su it's such an important element of this work is trying to understand how you can create mutual gains with the water users who are relying on the same resource. Um, one of the things that We've certainly seen in Fort Stockton, and I'm sure our partners in other geographies have experienced and will experience is it's not really a question of going out and dangling money in front of people. Um, you know, you have to have a compelling reason for people to share their water with you, whether they're permanently selling it or making it available via lease or, or option. And oftentimes that's not just about a dollar sign. It's about what they intend to do with their water, um, how they intend to continue their own operations. And that's been a really dynamic environment in the Permian Basin. That's where Fort Stockton's located. Up until about a year ago, we were having to think about whether or not the sorts of options we wanted to put in front of water rights holders were going to be compelling in an environment where you had oil and gas producers um, scooping up water for many, many orders of magnitude more than even municipal water users are paying. Um, fortunately for us, at least for the time being, that dynamic has changed demonstrably. Um, but you know, 80% of the water currently used out there is ag. 20% is municipal for the city of Fort Stockton. Within the process of us developing the feasibility study and beginning to engage with water rights holders, um, a contract for a, a substantial amount of water uh, was signed between one of the water right holders and the cities of Midland, Abilene, and San Angelo. Um, and while it's not entirely clear when that water contract will actually uh, go live from the standpoint of when the water will begin to be produced. Um, you know, the, those cities are currently paying for that water. Um, and so it really changes the way we have to think about all the different tools that need to be brought to the table. I think the, the great news is that we have a good working example um, of a basin that's very similar, uh, both in its um, hydrogeology, but also in the types of ways that water is used. 
and that's the San Antonio Edwards. So um, we've really, um, I think, diversified the set of tools that we're looking at to achieve that outcome of continuous minimum spring flow. We're looking at things that others here are talking about today, forbearance agreements or crop switching options with irrigators uh, to get at that 80% of current uh, ag use. But we're also looking at what we do with municipal permits. So we have the city of Fort Stockton uh, very keen on the economic diversification um, from a restored Comanche Springs. They're right on the edge of the Big Bend where their neighbors see uh, have seen a huge amount of income growth over time from tourist visitation. Uh, the city is really eager to be able to diversify. They're still highly dependent on cyclical oil and gas. Um, and so, you know, we're looking with the city at a source switch for their drinking water supply. Uh, we're looking at how we might create cooperative opportunities with irrigators that uh, might benefit from source switches as well. So going to deeper sources of water below the Edwards Trinity. Um, and then uh, especially with a large municipal supply contract now in place, uh, for the West Texas Water Partnership. Uh, we're interested in how things like aquifer storage and recovery, groundwater to groundwater storage uh, could actually be used to kind of smooth the uh, production impact on water levels in the Edwards Trinity and allow that continuous minimum spring flow to continue. But we've got a, a good working example of exactly that in the San Antonio Edwards. Uh, we've, we've been in conversation with all of the major water rights holders in that area, and we're in active dialogues with a number of them around very specific um, concepts that are related to their operations, but with that kind of mutual gains uh, question in mind. Great, thank you. Um, Charlene and, and Romy and Kyle, those of you who work in West Texas, what do you see as opportunities that are coming out of the efforts to address orphaned wells across the country, not just in Texas, but across the country, in the water issues associated with those wells in terms of your objectives? I know, Kyle, for example, TNC has at least two, maybe three preserves, spring-fed preserves in that region. You know, are they impacted by that some of that legacy of drilling? And if so, what opportunities exist with what's potentially a significant amount of infrastructure funding to address those issues? And what does that mean for your work? Yeah, I think to the uh, address the question about specific impacts to our preserves and the, the spring systems that we're protecting there. Um, you know, the orphan well issue is a, 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 at times a highly localized one. And, and so we're taking um, an approach at this point of evaluating the, the specific impacts to those to those areas and um, trying to determine uh, the, the, the sort of uh, groundwater hydrology connections to the, the, you know, any oil and gas activity and our, our uh, spring systems out there. Um, having that, um, that understanding and having the science to support any sort of decision making is is what we see as the first step that's necessary. I'm happy to jump in unless Romy wants to go, but um, I think if you're operating in the Permian and the Pecos, there's no getting away from produced water and orphaned oil and gas wells is kind of one facet of that. Um, we've only really begun to scratch the surface on it. Uh, I'll echo what Kyle is saying. Um, when you're dealing with groundwater, and especially when you're dealing with produced water, there's such a considerable investment in science that um, we as conservation practitioners um, have to uh, you know, invest into the space to be able to drive at good decision making. Sadly, there's no textbook answer. There's no ready data source that will answer all of the questions that we have about the provenance of water, about interventions that are appropriate or uh, durable. Um, but it's, uh, I think we've really benefited from partners there who similarly um, have challenges posed by that sort of um, legacy infrastructure. And I have a lot of hope that some of the flush of infrastructure spending that people are anticipating, and it's already kind of come down the pipe for Texas, will allow us to demonstrate in kind of pilot project scale that there is a, a real opportunity to intervene in a way that creates ecological benefit. For me, 
I, I look at it uh, through a little bit of a different perspective than many of my colleagues do. In the region that we're operating in, the upper uh, Pecos Basin of Texas, we see uh, some of this orphaned infrastructure uh, resulting in surface water features that um, in some cases, you know, we may think of serving as surrogate wetlands for a river system that has, for most intents and purposes, ecologically dead. And what is that, how does that influence, is that an important component on the landscape today for migratory birds, for overwintering waterfowl, for shorebirds? And um, as we, you know, as, as we look at this, it's really easy to say, like, these are, these are issues that need to be addressed, plug and cap these wells so that, um, that this communication between deep super saline aquifer systems and the surface water features and the shallow alluvial um, river system there, um, we kind of cut that off, but are, for, through the bird perspective, are, are we hampering a population um, of birds and important habitat? And if so, can we, can we use that as a justifi justification to prioritize wetland restoration along this river um, working within the system? So it provides all sorts of, of really fun opportunities through, um, you know, economic stimulus packages, through working with our partners in oil and gas, but also looking at um, you know some interesting ecological questions. So there's a, there's a lot of fun discussions had around this this particular set of issues. Great, thank you all. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna pivot to the hill country now into a, a, a similar conservation effort, similar in the sense of trying to protect a, a, a critical and beloved spring system. Uh, that would be Jacob's well. And uh, I'm gonna pose this question to David Baker from Wimberley Valley Watershed Association, who's been, what David, quarter century of trying to protect Jacob's well. So thank you for that. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities associated with utilizing these market-based incentive approaches to address water quantity impacts that are resulting from municipal groundwater use instead of what we were just discussing in um, West Texas, which is agricultural ground and, and surface water use. And maybe you could just set the stage a bit for attendees about Jacob's Well in case they're not uh, familiar with it. Sure, Andrew, thank you. Yeah, uh, Jacob's Well is, a, is an artesian spring it's fed by the Trinity, Middle Trinity Aquifer. It's about 35 miles southwest of Austin, uh, in the in just slightly outside of the Edwards Aquifer recharge zone. And so we've been studying it and uh, you know purchased property around it about 30 years ago, and started the science work to characterize that system. No one was monitoring flow. No one was monitoring water quality. Uh, they didn't understand the hydrologic system. And, you know, we spent almost that, that entire time characterizing it to a point where now we know uh, the specific geography that is recharging it. And we've been able to work with the Groundwater Conservation District to uh, put that into a, a special groundwater management zone that has its own unique rules. Um, I think, you know, there, there, we've heard, you know, the, the systemic issues. I think Frank Doby best described, you know, weather in, in the hill country by saying it's a perpetual state of drought interrupted by intermittent flooding. And I think that that challenge of, you know, this drought flood cycle, the climactic variation is, is, is always been a problem, you know, for, uh, you know, for this central and western te uh, Texas. But the fact that I think, you know, when we get to what we're doing at a policy level, very early on, I realized that, you know, this, this disconnect between how, this, how we manage surface water, the state giving out permits and managing those permits, and then groundwater being owned in place by the landowners and that there being very little um, um, ability to, to regulate what people, uh, how people use that water for beneficial use. Uh, we've seen, uh, I think, uh, 
this trend, we're in the second fastest growing state uh, county in the United States. So the demand is increasing at such a, a, a acute level uh, because there's just more and more people moving in, more fragmentation of land. So we've really focused on this critical zone where, as, as Charlene mentioned, it's a karst aquifer where the water recharges the well. But the one of the challenges is we have policy that allows for a 30-foot uh, decline in aquifer levels, which essentially doubles the amount of pumping. And uh, so we focused on, you know, land conservation is one, one aspect of our work. But this work with, with Charlene and the market makers, I think we've identified, you know, acute wells that are causing uh, problems to, in terms of spring flow, in terms of decrease. And I think we're looking at source switch, you know, to move those wells to a less impactful area as a kind of intermediate step, looking at ASR, uh, looking at potentially, you know, bringing in water from other places. And then, then the line loss, you know, uh, getting these systems to be more efficient through, um, uh, you know, fixing their leaks. Um, every drop counts, we're trying to restore uh, maintain a flow of at least two cubic feet per second during times of drought. And so we saw Jacob's Well stop flowing for the first time in history, known history, in, two, in the year 2000. So in 2011, of course, we saw, you know, completely stop. And even at this time, right now, we're, we're about one CFS. So uh, I think, you know, this work has has identified some, I think, solutions uh, to uh, maintain that base flow. But I think the other aspect that was mentioned earlier is is, is this trust building. Uh, who are the who are the partners that really care about these these resources? Um, the communities invested um, millions of dollars in Jacobs Well and uh, Blue Hole. We have a hundred thousand visitors that come that are uh, that support our economy, and that's. You know, about 80% of our economy is, is based on this tourism that's really driven by these iconic um, um, swimming holes and the Blanco River that it contributes to. So I think the community understands that it's important um, that we, we conserve these resources, but there, there is a, uh, a bit of a disconnect between the fact that we have to have some kind of cap to truly create a market and we need a geographic pool of water if we were going to ever trade, you know, or buy uh, certain rights. Um, the Trinity is not like the Edwards. It's not a contiguous pool across multiple counties. So these management zones, we think, are really the place to get at um, being able to create areas that are uh, feeding these springs and these base flows to these rivers and then really working within those watersheds and those critical recharge zones um, to do the proper science to get the um, uh, identify those those key water rights holders, and then the the sources of revenue to then buy down those rights or trade those rights. Um, it's it's challenging, but I, I feel like we've made some tremendous progress working with Charlene and the team. And certainly learned so much from from working with these other um, uh, wonderful conservation professionals. It's just it's been a, a fantastic experience so far. Great, thank you. And just a reminder to attendees um, that if you have any questions or comments, put them in the chat box. They'll get conveyed to me. Um, House Bill twenty six fifty two by Representative Larson. Um, Currently before Texas legislature would create a board to study groundwater, surface water interactions. If it passes, how do you think that might begin to change thinking around these issues and eventually policy surrounding management of water resources? That's an open question for any panelists. David, you want to take a shot? Yeah. I think that's it's it's a great great bill. It's something that that needs to happen because I think that that we can't you know paint the state with one homogenous policy. I think there there are certain areas like uh, right here at Jacobs Well, Pleasant Valley Springs, uh, the Devil's River. There, there's different areas that that really need to be managed um, for 
the spring flow and the, and the relationship to that groundwater uh, that's feeding it. And we need to treat that really as one system, which I think this kind of study would, would potentially identify those key areas in the state that maybe need to have um, a more integrated approach to management. So I think this is a great, uh, a great bill. Great, thank you. All right, there's another question in the chat box I'm gonna hold off on on produced water. I'm gonna pose the last panelist question to Kyle Garmany, who's been working on in-stream flow issues both at the agency level and now as a practitioner at TNC uh, for the last five or so years um, and working really across the, the state. Uh, given those efforts, Kyle, how do you assess and determine your role and TNC's best role in the work you do and the work you collaborate with other conservation partners in your priority uh, geographies around the state? Yeah, the TNC's approach to, to flow restoration and protection has always been guided by, by science, but it's also informed by our relationships. Um, you know, we use the, the decades of established environmental flow science in Texas, as well as um, uh, existing hydrology data and, and water rights data and other conservation um, data that, that are priorities for TNC to help us identify um, where we work, but also identify the volumes of, of water and the timing of flows that are needed to restore and protect the systems that we're working in. Um, you, you know, we then work with our key partners in, in geographies where they exist, um, other conservation groups and, and stakeholders that have a shared interest in, in flow protection in the watersheds that we're working in. Um, and, and really that conversation helps to, to refine and focus the restoration goals and, and the flow objectives. Uh, our, our role when it comes to implementation of the, the work um, then focuses uh, on you know, what's needed you know, in, in what capacity our partners have uh, in those places where we're working. You know, we try and help to support the, the outreach uh, and will lead in the development of the transaction scenarios, um, you, you know, the, the due diligence as well as the, uh, the, the in, um, negotiations. Uh, we raise funding for the transactions and, and then we will, you know, uh, process any necessary regulatory amendments through TCQ to really ensure that there's legal protection uh, for those water rights in stream. Um, and then we also, you know, assist in monitoring the outcome. So as I see it, it it's really dependent on our, our, you know, first off, we let the science lead us to where we should be working. And then once we identify those places where we're working is really engaging with other stakeholders and our conservation partners to make sure that we align the work in, in the most efficient way. Thanks, Kyle. Any, any uh, comments or questions? And maybe from the perspective of particularly Galveston Bay as a local group, how your and, and Matt, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but how you engage with TNC and Kyle and Charlene and Texas Water Trade as sort of statewide groups. And how, do, how does that partnership be most effective? What are the ingredients for a most effective partnership there? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, utilizing our relationships with landowners as, uh, you know, our, our significance in the project, but utilizing Kyle's uh, and Charlene's experience and expertise in water transactions to develop these um, more, more complex contracts that, that we don't have any experience doing. So we, we lean on them for their knowledge and expertise, and we can be uh, the, the local partner that, that can go out there and inspect our projects and work with our landowners on a on a more regular basis uh, being right here in our backyard. So I think that's a good partnership. Great. Okay, uh, Charlene, nope, you're still on mute. Uh, another question actually for Danielle. Um, you know, David mentioned second fastest growing county. That's amazing. It's, uh, it's I'm sure a challenge for your county in the, in the country. Um, obviously, Demand for water in the Houston area continues to grow as well. Um, how are you all looking at urban and municipal water demand in terms of 
forward looking in terms of how it could impact your efforts to restore freshwater to ecosystems? And is there anything you can do about that? I think there is, you know, GBF, we have other programs that we're working on to try to increase efficiency, um, make sure that um, we're using our water resources wisely in this state, um, you know, anywhere from individual consumption to also ensuring that tools that we already have, legislative tools that we already have um, to increase efficiency from municipalities, our water utilities um, are really being utilized. Um, so it's more of a holistic approach. Um, we're definitely concerned about, you know, whenever we hear large um, infrastructure projects going up um, for water supply, and we wanna make sure that we're being efficient with the resources that we currently have before we um, continue to build out those infrastructures, so. And is there an alliance with your landowner's interests, like say in East Bay where growth, you know, continues to, creep out I-10 corridor to preserving the landscapes of East Bay in a way that provide both working landscapes and opportunities for habitat? Well, you know, many people in this region are um, looking forward to that growth and development, um, especially specifically in the uh, western portion of, of Chambers County. But what we've noticed uh, that you know, when we were developing this project, we noticed that this um, water transaction will have economic benefits to the region. Uh, not only is we've see, been seeing less and less rice production over the years, which is drawing less and less water purchase from the local water authority. Um, us bringing, being a new customer can help uh, generate revenue for that and keep water costs down for our ag producers. So I think there is, uh, for, the, for the large scale landowners, the big producers, the ag producers, this is seen as uh, um, a, a good thing. That's great. I mean, so often, you know, conservation interests are perceived as, you know, a threat or a risk for ag producers. And here's an instance where the collaboration can actually help protect the resources against urban growth, uh, if done correctly. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, I want to pivot back to produced water. There was a question posed are we still dealing with the lack of knowledge about what even is produced water? Uh, what's in that produced water? And is that proprietary information that's making it difficult to make decisions about future management? And Romy, I'm thinking of, you know, Audubon's interest in, you know, potentially creating artificial or surrogate wetland complexes with produced water. Is this a challenge, this lack of knowledge and information? Yeah, it, it, Andrew, it really, it really is. It, it's, a, it's a real challenge because, um, I mean, it all starts with what, what is in the water that's down there to begin with and then how it interacts with some of the uh, fracking solutions, um, which are proprietary and aren't, aren't really well understood. I mean, I think we're gaining some, some ground. Um, Generally, with some of our partnerships, some folks are studying studying some of these solutions. But there's uh, there's a real concern in, in how we both store that water, or if it's going to um, if it's going to intersect with existing surface water features. You know, what does that do to our water quality? Who's regulating it? Um, who's paying attention to it? And how, um, if and how can we use that in uh, some of these restoration ideas that we're, that we're uh, hoping to advance? And that's, I mean, you know, that we've got significant fracking activity in, in many different and disparate regions of the state. So it's not exclusive to the Pecos or the Permian at all. If I could jump in, Andrew, respond to that as well. I mean, I think that's one of the real strengths of the partnerships that we've all crafted together, the folks who are all on this panel today. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time at Water Trade thinking about highly decentralized water infrastructure, and that's been typically through the municipal lens. Um, but the, you know, similar questions around monitoring and appropriate treatment um, come up in that context. And, um, you know, with Audubon and TNC, um, you know, we've just started looking at these specific wells where just so, so folks know, 
the produced water in this specific context is already interacting with the environment. Um, and as far as we understand it, and, and part of what we're looking to do is invest our resources in better understanding what's driving that flow um, from the subsurface up to the surface, uh, you know, there's a very high probability that that flow will not be mitigated for quite some time. Um, and so through that lens, you know, we really are looking at how we bring appropriate technologies um, to uh, the concepts that Romy discussed. Um, and I think even in the context of unknown contaminants, there are ways that you design a system to respond, um, uh, to, to be able to manage what could be in the water. And then you uh, monitor for proxies that if they survive, other things could survive. But so there are ways of getting at it, even with those unknowns there. But it's a it's a great question. And it's why I think you need to have multidisciplinary teams to be able to think about these things um, and, and manage them effectively. Yeah, and, and uh, one last question before I ask it, uh, and this the last question is related to legislation. My understanding is there's also legislation to create a produced water consortium at Texas Tech, which would be multidisciplinary, which could help advance knowledge um, and practice around produced water and what to do with it. Okay, um, how might House Bill 2225 around the Texas Water Trust and you know encouraging uh, contributions to the Water Trust impact this work in the future. And uh, Kyle, I'm gonna ask you to respond to that first, given your past experience at Texas Parks and Wildlife. Well, yeah, this is a great bill that, that you know, TNC supports as do many of our conservation partners. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the Texas Water Trust um, is an underutilized vehicle for protection of, of Texas freshwater resources. And this bill really helps to, to clarify Parks and Wildlife and their role um, in engagement and kind of requires that they um, encourage more uh, utilization of uh, voluntary transfers into the trust. And um, it, it's, it really is going to, I feel, helps to clarify their role um, and to provide them, um, you know, the authority to, to take more active role in uh, voluntary transfers, um, in, including, you know, uh, in as a partner in the work that we're currently doing and, and as an applicant to Texas Water Trades Flows Fund um, and, and uh, allowing them the capability to more actively uh, pursue this as a strategy, environmental water transactions as a strategy to, refor to restore flow. Other thoughts on that, Charlene? Any perspective from you? Um, we've uh, not been tracking that bill quite as closely as some other conservation partners, but I mean, I think it's, it's clear that, um, you know, one of the things that's needed, whether you're looking in the surface water side or the groundwater side is having appropriate tools in place to ensure that if you're conserving something on paper, that it's actually protected through some sort of um, legal structure. And so this that specific piece of legislation certainly seems to um, be a response to, to that um, necessary evolution. And I'll just offer similarly on the groundwater side of things, you know, the kind of perennial ongoing conversation about how you protect groundwater in place and create assurances for that, whether it's through the Texas Water Trust or if it's through trusts that are created by groundwater conservation districts, these are things that um, you know people are kind of testing the boundaries of and are really pivotally important to ensuring longevity of this as a conservation practice. Great. Well, my first entree, as I said at the outset, into Texas Water was the Texas Water Trust. So it would be great to see it become something really important to the efforts that are going on here. And I'd just like to really uh, congratulate the panelists, the groups that are engaging in this work. You know, I've had the good fortune of working in this space across the Western US for most of my career. Uh, I think it's over 27 years now. And uh, obviously there's benefit of learning from what's been done in the past, but people don't always have to take, don't always pay attention to what's been learned in the past. And, Everybody in Texas has been all years on what can be learned from elsewhere, what's unique here. And I would assert that the momentum that's been created in the last couple, you know, four or five years, really starting with the TEFI, uh, is greater than in other regions of the Western US. And um, 
I would just encourage other conservation interests to ponder uh, how these strategies could be part of your work and your mission in the state, uh, because it is such an important issue facing the state and the future of the state. Um, and it's big and it's challenging, but I think the panelists have shown that it's manageable and doable too with energy and resources and focus. Uh, so again, just thank you to the panelists. And then, you know, thank you to Lori Olson and, and TLTC for uh, allowing us to present and discuss again uh, today, following up on last year. Hopefully next year, it's something in person. Um, and we'll look forward to continuing to dialogue. I, there was one question that was asked that we didn't have time for, for David Baker. So we're going to try to make that connection, but of course, feel free to follow up with any of the panelists uh, or me if you have additional questions. And again, thank you for your time today and enjoy the rest of the TLTC conference.